So I was raised in Angelina's restaurant, where I learned how to set a table before I knew my ABCs. Angelina's was my maternal family's family restaurant business, where my mother worked as a waitress. I can still picture my grandmother, Emilia, whom we all called Ma, because it wasn't professional to call her grandma or something like that in the restaurant. She would sit at the family table, polishing the flatware, wiping out glasses, and greeting her customers upon their arrival. Yes, the food was fresh and delicious. And my uncle bartender made a fabulous old fashioned. But the regular customers and tourists alike were predominantly drawn in for the entertainment. Angelina's had a renowned legacy of open familial bickering, drunken drama, and behind the scenes scandal worthy of a television sitcom. If reality TV was around back then, my family would have been stars. There's an old family story which goes like this. Two women entered the restaurant. This is the place I was telling you about. See, there's the father over there, and, and that's the son behind the bar. And my grandfather, who we all called Pa, jumped in and said, and the Holy Ghost is in the back, talking about my grandmother, not realizing that she was right behind him until she bopped him in the head. Good evening, she said, never breaking the smile. Table for two? Now, my grandmother was Emilia. Angelina was my great-grandmother, and that was the woman we called Nonna. But Nonna was dead before I was born. She died in the 50s. Nonna came to America from Piemonte, Ma used to tell me. She left me in Italy, and she worked hard as a laundry woman here in a rooming house on McDougal Street. She saved all her money, and she, bought me this, she brought me to this country when I was 12. And in 1936, she gave me this restaurant so that I could work and take care of my family. This restaurant is the roots of our family. All this Nonna did with no school, no college, and me too. I went to school, but only third grade, and then I went to work as a seamstress. No college, but I know how to make money. I know how to run a business, so you and your mother and the rest of the family don't ever have to go hungry. All this with no college, not like your no good bum grandfather, the one with college, 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 my fungul college. Fork you, lady, Pa said. My grandfather used to work as a banker, but he embezzled money and went to prison for three years, which is why my great grandmother gave the restaurant to her daughter to take care of her three children while her no good bum of a husband was in jail. When Pa got out of prison, he came and was demoted to salad man in the restaurant. He didn't talk very much, probably because he was always thinking and smoking. He sat at the family table and lit up Chesterfield cigarettes one after another. I liked the way he held the cigarette between his first and middle finger, and after he took a puff, he put his elbow on the table and his thumb against the side of his head, and he let the cigarette smoke come out in rings that he blew across the restaurant. With his other hand, he absent-mindedly tugged the skin at his neck. It was all so glamorous. I couldn't wait to grow up and be able to smoke. What are you thinking about, Pa? He moved the cigarette from his head and patted me on the top of mine. I'm thinking about how I love my wife, but I hate my boss. I knew all of the regulars at the restaurant, the doctors from St. Vincent's Hospital just up the street, and the detectives from the 6th Precinct just a few blocks away. They all came in early and sat at the bar for cocktails before going to a table for dinner. I especially liked when Ma would ask me to wipe down the front of the cigarette machine so I could be close to the bar and watch my uncle make cocktails and listen to the grown-up conversations. Sometimes the customers would give me money and ask me to get them a pack of cigarettes. At first they were amazed that I knew how to work the machine because of the plunger levers that you had to pull out to make the cigarettes drop down. I learned how to work the machines from my dad. He was a vending machine mechanic. He sometimes used to bring me with work, uh, to work with him when he would fix the vending machines on the subway platforms. So I knew how to work all kinds of vending machines. The ones that sold soda and coffee had push buttons, but the ones that sold candy and cigarettes had the plungers. 
They were very impressed, these customers, because I could always bring them the right cigarettes, even though I was a little girl and didn't know how to read. I could see the different cigarette boxes through the glass, and I knew all the songs about each brand from the TV commercials. So I would hum the jingle that I remembered from TV and look for the box that matched the song. You can take Salem out of the country, but you can't take the country out of Salem. Here you go, doctor, I'd say, handing him the green and white pack of cigarettes. And then I'd give him the leftover dime, knowing that the nickel was my tip for getting him the cigarettes. The detectives were more generous. I would be able to keep the dime, too. Thank you, I said out loud, remembering what Ma always said, never ask, but never refuse. You're a cute little kid, the detective said, but not as good looking as Glow Girl. That was my mommy's nickname, Glow Girl. Her name was Gloria, but she was very beautiful. They used to say that she stopped traffic on the streets. I didn't like the way the detective licked the stirrer from his cocktail when he talked about my mommy. Get away from the bar, Ma said, giving me two menus and shooing me towards the front door. Good evening, Father. Table for two? I ran to the table where Mommy had seated another regular customer, the, pa the pastor from St. Bernard's Parish. Welcome to Angelina's, Father Fitzgerald. I gave him and his guests the menus. Look at you, just like your grandmother. Are you going to be a restaurateur when you grow up too? Oh no, I'm going to go to college and be a nuclear physicist. He smiled at me. What a smart little girl, already talking about college. And then he turned towards Ma, sitting at the family table. You're going to have to sell a lot of spaghetti for that. I noticed that Ma didn't laugh, but Pa did. I would mimic Ma when I was in the restaurant, walking from table to table, chatting with the customers. Often I was invited to pull up a chair. The customers could not resist my innocent revelations of family secrets. They would give me their undivided attention, eyes wide and mouths unable to refrain from audible gasps of shock and delight at my stories. Ma would be straining to hear from the family table, twisting a napkin nervously while summoning my mother in Italian. Get her away from the customers. She'll tell, she's telling them everything. Angela, my mom would sing, come here now. Don't bother anyone. Oh, don't worry, mommy. I didn't tell Father Fitzgerald you say F-U-C-K. I reveled in the customer's laughter, even as my mother dragged me to the bathroom for a spanking. There wasn't a lot of laughter in my young life. My parents had separated when I was an infant, and all they did was fight about money and visitation. And no matter who I was with, they always talked bad about each other. The adoring attention from the customers helped me escape from the reality of my angry family. Angelina's was closed to the public on Christmas Day. And when I was growing up, our family's tradition on my mother's side was to gather at the restaurant for Christmas dinner. The tables in the front dining room of the restaurant would have already been rearranged the night before by the porter to create one long banquet style table. Ma would sit at the head of the table, Pa sat to her left, chain smoking his Chesterfields and sneaking to the bar to fill his demi-tasse cup with scotch whenever possible. My mother sat in her position of matriarchal power to Ma's right. Everyone else filled in the seats as they arrived, starting with the ones as far away from my mother as possible. These remaining guests of aunts, uncles, and cousins changed over the years, depending on who had grown up and moved away, or who was divorced and back with children. There was no flow of arrivals and casual mingling before the dinner. We were all expected to arrive on time at 2 o'clock, hang our coats on the rack in the hall, get a beverage from behind the bar, then sit down and start eating the antipasto and Zito's bread that was preset on platters down the center of the banquet table. It was a sumptuous selection of cured meats, chunks of imported cheeses, pickled carrots and cauliflower, celery and olives, marinated mushrooms, and my favorite, pimentos and anchovies swimming in olive oil. There were no niceties. It was every man, woman, or kid for him or herself, forks stabbing into the platters straight for the prize prosciutto di Parma and Genoa salami, with uh, within seconds leaving the mortadella, which I still call fatty bologna, alone on the platters for my grandmother to eat while admonishing us. Don't waste, or someday you'll be looking in a garbage pail for food. That one sentence still resonates, forcing me to clear my plate to this very day. After the antipasto, we would be allowed to leave the table to use the restroom or get another drink while we waited for the next course of baked clams, which would be followed by the soup, either tortellini and brodo or minestrone. 
To a stranger, the scene would have seemed pleasant, heartwarming even. Children playing hide-and-seek under the table, Ma nursing her ginger ale while everyone else sipped wine. Even the children were given a little bit of wine mixed with water or ginger ale to help them sleep. We all savored the aromas wafting from the kitchen, the roasting turkey, the escarole sautéing in garlic, and the herb stuffing, and lasagna too, because turkey was really meant for Thanksgiving, and lasagna was good for leftovers. I suspect the others held on to their own fantasy as I did, of a Christmas dinner without incident, praying this might be the year to enjoy that delicious food, delicious food without achita. But inevitably, the fighting would begin just as the soup was ready to be served. More often than not, the fights were started by, or at least egged on, by my mother. It was just a part of Christmas dinner tradition that she ended up yelling at someone who ended up crying and eventually vacated the restaurant, either too angry or too drunk to care about sticking around for the rest of the meal. And it was always a good excuse for leaving my older half-sister behind to clean up, spending hours after everyone else had departed, washing out pots and pans and dishes and making sure the restaurant was all back in order to open the next day. My sister and I had different fathers, but shared the same mother. She was the good daughter, the one who always took our mother's side. The last time I spent Christmas at Angelina's was in 1979. I was just 18 and home on break from my first semester at college. And that year, I was blessed with the honor of the traditional Christmas argument with my mother. It started out simply. I presented my mother with two envelopes containing bills for my second semester at Hofstra. One envelope held the tuition bill for the next semester, and the other was for room and board. They were almost identical in amount. I can't remember how much each one's, but like $50 apart between the two bills. An important caveat I need to mention is that my college education was the one and only time that my parents had agreed to split the bills on their own without going to court. Here, I said, offering my mother both of the invoices to review. Before I forget to give these to you, just want to tell you, Dad said you should pay whichever one you want and he'll pay the other. Immediately, I could see her pursed lips and glowering eyes, and I knew that I had pissed her off. I braced myself for the tirade. How dare you tell me what your father says I should do? He has the audacity to give me orders? Mom, he's not giving you orders. He's offering you the opportunity to choose which bill you want to pay. What's, what's wrong with you? Oh, really? He's offering me? Your father never offered me anything. You tell him to go fuck himself. You tell him to choose whatever bill he wants to pay, and I'll pay the other. Oh, my God, Mom, it's Christmas Day. Do you have to be like this on Christmas Day? Does everything have to be an argument? Why can't you just pick one and let it go? Well, screw you, too. She put on her coat. I'm going home. Enjoy your goddamn Christmas dinner. And she left. The silence was thick disturbed only by the clanking of spoons as the rest of the family dug into their soup. Putana Madonna, my grandmother swore in Italian, slamming her hands down on the table. It was not unusual for Ma to express her frustrations in life by calling the Virgin Mary a whore. No special reverence for the Mother of God, not even on Christmas Day. You have to go get her, my sister said, without looking up from her bowl. Why? What? It's freezing out. I'm not going after her. In fact, I'm glad she left. Now the rest of us can eat in peace. Via, via, Ma yelled in Italian. Go, go. Yes, my sister replied. Go get her, Angela. Go now. I looked around the room for an ally, and all I saw was snickering profiles. Cowards hiding their heads in their bowls of soup. Stifling laughs, rolling eyes, nodding smirks. All of them relieved to not be the victim of my mother's Christmas wrath. The three and a half black walk from the restaurant to the apartment seemed longer than I remembered. I plowed ahead with purpose, bucking the winter winds, cursing out loud, daring any random person spreading Christmas cheer to cross my path and bear witness to my rage. By the time I arrived at the apartment building, my legs were numb, exposed from the knees down and covered only by a thin nylon of my pantyhose, a contrast to the warmth of the red rage I could feel in my face and the tears streaming from my eyes. Symptoms of the cold, I would say, if she asked. I would never give her the satisfaction of seeing me cry. Once in the apartment building vestibule, I pressed on the buzzer and gave the obligatory three-ring code. I waited. No response. Again, buzz, buzz, buzz. Nothing. My tears stopped and my fury escalated. I gave three more pushes on the buzzer while simultaneously banging and slamming my body three times against the wall, which is adjacent to the living room of the first floor apartment. 
I screamed. Mommy, it's Angela. Open the frigging door. It's freezing out here. I had raised my voice loud enough for her and Mr. Karuda, the neighbor in the next apartment, to hear. Even though she hated him and blamed him for the bombing of Pearl Harbor behind his back, I knew what her reaction would be. God forbid he should hear me yelling and know our personal business. She abruptly came out of the apartment and opened the door to the vestibule, telling me to shush through her gritted teeth. I followed her back into the apartment, letting the vestibule door slam and stomping my feet, mostly in an attempt to get the blood circulating, but also for dramatic emphasis. We stood in the apartment living room face to face. I was consciously out of her striking range, but still vulnerable to the verbal attack. I sparred with her, insult for insult, tit for tat. The moment was timeless, a rerun of a lifetime of my mother taking out her anger with her father on me and me defending him regardless of the consequences. We each held our ground, anticipating that the other would not back down. He's a son of a bitch, living in sin with that whore, she said. He doesn't care about you. He just wants the money from the restaurant when I drop dead. If both of you were drowning, he'd save her over you. Do you know that? Stop it, Mom. Stop saying these terrible things to me. I hated when she did that. I hated and I wanted to tell her that I hated her. But I could never get those words out of my mouth. I didn't want to be like her. Instead, I withstood her verbal assault and continued to defend my dad. I was defiant, knowing and waiting for what would come next. She would lunge for my throat or throw something. I braced myself, for pre prepared for the physical pain. My sister was not there to mediate, to separate us, to call the truce. But this time, she caught me off guard. She sat suddenly and lit a cigarette. She never took her eyes off me. She was a seasoned warrior who knew never to trust her opponent. She looked up at me and dragged on the cigarette she held in her lips. She squinted from the smoke that arose around her face. Drag after drag, she continued to glare at me. She reached into her pocket. I leaned back with caution as she extended her hand to me. Here's the check. It's for the more expensive one. Take it. Tell that SOB to go to hell when he asks you if I went into the mattress. And don't you ever, ever tell me what that man says for me to do. She then released the smoke from her lungs and noticeably relaxed. I took a deep breath and savored the momentary high of her secondhand smoke. Okay, Mom, I'm sorry for upsetting you, but why do you have to react like that? Why do you have to call him names? Why do you have to talk to me like that? I'm your mother. I can talk to you however I damn well please. No, Mom, I can walk down the street and have any low life in the world talk to me like that. But right, you're my mother. And that's the reason you shouldn't talk to me like that. That's the reason I try not to talk to you like that. She remained silent, contemplating, staring at me, dragging on her cigarette and puffing out plumes of smoke in my direction again and again until it was down to the filter. Her expression softened as she squashed the cigarette out into the ashtray. Okay, I'm ready to go back now, she said as she stood up and put on her coat. I followed her in silence out of the apartment, down the steps, and into the curb, feeling drained but satisfied. She would never apologize to me. Mom never apologized to anyone. But I had the last word. I knew that I had been heard. I also knew better than to expect any more from her. Thanks for the check, Mommy. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. Now let's go back, because I'm fucking starving. We hailed down a taxi, and we were back in Angelina's in time for the lasagna.